Hey, my name is Caden and I want to thank you for joining us today. We hope this message inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. Y'all doing all right? Yeah, good. I, I uh, um, lost a little bit of sleep last night due to the thunder. I, I know talking about the weather is a little cliche, but we have a 75 pound panic attack called a dog in our house that um, the, the doesn't like the thunder. So I ended up um, with him somewhere around 3.30 to 4.30. So if I need a nap in the middle of the sermon, that's what that's about. Um, but we are glad you are here. When I was in high school, um, I was awesome at precisely nothing. Um, any, anybody else like that? Like I, I was okay. I was, I was a, I was a wide range student. I, um, I made A's, B's, C's, and D's in high school. I even had a couple of F's. Um, I, and I had some classes I did great in. I had some, I, um, I bombed, um, there was the whole range. And then athletics, I, I was, <laughs> I was, I was not an athlete. And I hung out with a group of jocks and it was kind of me and one other guy that were like, not, you know, and I just wanted to uh, read poetry and play guitar um, while they wanted to um, pulverize each other and, you know, and that's kind of how, they, but I was okay. I feel like the one thing I was kind of okay at was uh, swimming. I was, um, uh, I was, swimming's maybe a little bigger in Florida and I was decently fast. I was the fourth fastest on our team, which meant I made the relay and every year we would go to states. And so that was fu- as our relay. It was fun to be able to say, um, even not being super awesome, that I'm a state swimmer, you know? And it was really because these other guys like pulled the weight for me um, and I, I d- totally didn't um, sink the rest of the relay. And when I was going into my senior year, 99, 2000, we got some really good news that there was a guy joining our team named Raymond Rizel, um, and he was being sent to Clearwater by the Venezuelan government to finish his training for the 2000 Olympics. Um, and we were getting like a bona fide Olympic swimmer on our team. He's super humble, really nice guy, had like a jet ski motor implanted somewhere in his body. Um, he still holds most of the records that are available to have for my high school's swim team. Um, and, and that it was pretty awesome. It was like, hey, this is great. Now here's the challenge, is I was the fourth fastest on the team. Right? And I, I quickly became um, the, from the little piggy who had roast beef to the little piggy who had none. Um, and uh, and I, was, I no longer was on the relay. Um, and right, wrong, or, or indifferent, I decided to not even swim my senior year. Um, and I, I, had, I had lost my spot. And it's funny how something that was such good news um, for a little bit, for me, ended up feeling like bad news. Um, this was this was really cool for us, you know, and uh, and for me though that changed my whole relationship with um, with the swim team and everything else, and it it uh, freed me up to do other things like pretend like I was going to be a Metallica one day, you know, while playing my guitar in my garage. And um, sometimes it's funny how news itself can feel both good and bad at the same time, depending on how it hits you. And last week we started this series on the prophets um, for a couple reasons. One is because there's a lot of the prophets in our Bible and often we um, don't know what to do with them. They feel a little strange and foreign and, uh, and we wanna, I want to get more comfortable with those. But the other is the heart underneath it. That is when, um, when we think about the prophets, we tend to think about like predicting the future or something. And there's a little bit of that in scripture talking about the future, but most of the prophets has nothing to do with what's going to happen one day. It's not about predicting the future in our tradition. Um, it, it's, uh, it's not even so much about speaking to people. Now that pretty much always happens in our scripture, that the prophets end up um, speaking uh, words um, from God to, to a group. But really where prophecy um, gets its heart where it gets its, where it kind of has its identity in our scripture is from the good news that we have a God that wants to speak. We have a God that wants to call people, that wants to get close to them, that he is looking for people that want to listen. And that is really good news, that the king of creation wants to talk to you. If you want to listen, he, he doesn't need you, he just wants you. 
And that is really good news. The challenge as we look at the prophets though is sometimes they get close to God's heart and what they find is a broken one. And the good news that God wants to speak to us can feel like hard news because what they have to say is quite challenging. Now we looked at in the New Testament, we are commanded as followers of Jesus to, and I quote, eagerly desire the gift of prophecy, if you remember that from last week. Eagerly desire. That means to eagerly desire that we would hear from God, that we would, that we would make space to hear from the Lord of heaven and earth, and, and that we would be a gift to our community for three things. Anybody remember what they were? Strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Now, it's worth remembering that strengthening only happens through challenge. We only get stronger in any area of our life through challenge, through stretching, sometimes a little bit of breaking. That is how we grow as people. And the folks that get close to God's heart and listen to it sometimes are the people that need to carry challenge to their community on God's behalf. Now, if if we look at um, the Old Testament, I wanna kinda look at a few ways that this happens. So some context. Um, Saul is the first king. He's anointed uh, king by Samuel the prophet. We talked about him last week, um, how he just wanted to be in God's presence so much. He he literally would fall asleep next to the Ark of the Covenant and God chose to speak to him because of his desire to be close to the Lord. So he anoints Saul. Saul screws up, gets put in timeout, um, and David gets uh, anointed the new king um, and is a pretty good king. By David's grandkids, things are falling apart And there is, uh, one of his grandkids is, he's prideful, he's a narcissist, he's surrounded himself by people that just tell him how awesome he is and how much he should beat up on everybody else. Um, And uh, and, and that ends up driving the country to the brink of civil war. Um, And his brother uh, ends up leading a group of 10 tribes and he's leading a group of two. Um, And instead of going to battle, they decide to basically just get a divorce as a country. And 10 tribes form a new country in the north called Israel. Um, They have regions and cities like Samaria and Ephraim. And two tribes in the south form a new country called Judah. They have the temple. They have the religious system and the priests and the sacrifices. And, And these two countries separate and never come back together. Um, It's often something that is hard to remember when we're reading our Old Testament. And there are two particular challenges that the prophets tend to bring throughout Scripture. And one of them that we'll talk about today goes mostly to the northern kingdom. Not exclusively, but mostly. And I want to pick up some of this in um, in 1 Kings. By the way, I'm covering enough Scripture today that I just printed up a a bunch of it and taped it on the inside of here. So here's my cheat sheet if you're wondering what that's about. Um, 1 Kings 16. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, that's the south, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel in the north. He reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal, or we'll call him Baal, as just Westerners who speak English, um, and serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar to Baal at the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, And did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all of the kings in Israel before him. How would you like to be remembered that way? Here comes the prophet. Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishba and Gilead, said to Ahab, this is to the king, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except by my word. And this conflict kind of escalates. Um, it gets very exciting at certain points. Um, lots of people die at one point. Ooh, very, very rough. Um, chapter 18, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring 450 of the prophets of Baal and 400 of the prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word 
throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. That there's this issue in the ancient world where people end up in what the bible word for it is, idolatry. Where the God of heaven and earth ends up getting put aside for something else. And the prophet is the one who has to hear the broken heart of God and carry God's broken heart and anger sometimes to the people that are responsible for it, who are leading the community. And remember, he's not going to the prime minister. He's not even going to the president. He is going to the king. And the prophet is always able to approach those in power and say challenging things that end up applying to the entire community. Now, what they're dealing with um, is, is idolatry. And so when we think of idols, we tend to think of like this. Um, so not so much that. Uh, but, you know, a grumpy British guy and Randy Jackson, who's super nice. Not, not that. Um, but more, more this. Um, this is Baal. Uh, he usually has a lightning rod or a thunderbolt in his hand. He's the storm god. Um, and he was one of the major gods in Canaan, which is the region that the Israelites moved into um, when, they, when they took over that area. And uh, here, here's another relief of him. It's a little hard to see. Can you see he's got this like fiery lightning bolt in one hand um, that he would like throw down on there? It's so when uh, he's over the rain and the storms. So when Elijah says, no rain until I say so, that is a direct challenge to this guy. Now, the other one that gets brought up a lot is Asherah. Um, Asherah is one of the mother goddesses in that region. Um, I, there's a lot of pictures of her. I won't show those because they're a little PG-13. Um, and you can figure out why on your own. So um, now, Baal and Asherah were fertility gods. Um, as one scholar puts it, they were worshipped uh, and sacrificed to and prayed to because people believed they could influence the reproduction of humans, herds, and harvest. Humans, herds, and harvest. Now, it is easy to look back on those people 2,500 years ago and think, how backward and weird is that? But it's hard to remember, I think, sometimes for us how at the mercy of the forces of nature these people were, um, how little control they had over if they could have a child or not, or if, or if their wife would live through childbirth. Um, their herds, that meant meat and food and things like milk, and they could, um, they could turn that in, into all kinds of, you know, there's cheese, and there was this fermented horse milk called um, kefir that I, I'm sure you guys would love to get in on, um, you know, like, oof. Um, but that, that was a big deal for food. But uh, they were also the, the John Deere tractors of their society. Um, the, the animals helped provide for everything else. And, and if they couldn't have more little animals, you were in trouble. And then harvest. I mean, anybody else trying to grow anything right now? No? Just, just a couple of us? Okay, so um, we tried uh, like above ground like planters a little bit on our back deck. We tried zucchini and it like took over part of the back deck. Anybody? And we got two zucchini out of it. <laughs> Growing stuff is hard. <laughs> And this was before um, fertilizer, and they were just figuring out irrigation. You know, and if you couldn't grow something, guess how long it was going to be before you could grow that crop again? A year. A year. And these folks must have lived with some serious amount of anxiety around if their uh, reproduction of humans, herds, and harvest were going to go okay. And what if they weren't? And we're sure God's great. I mean, you know, yeah, the Lord of heaven and earth. Um, but this other God seems to specialize a little bit. And, uh, and out of, I'm sure, fear, it's not so much in the Bible that God gets replaced by an idol every now and then. Most of the time, he's, he has, he's forced to share the spotlight with something else that people put their trust in, that people give their affection to, that, that people are anxious to have control over. Now that is something that we can talk about in any culture, in any community, in any stage of humanity. 
Now, as, as good Westerners, as I have heard it preached, we tend to talk about individual idols, which are very real. Um, I have things that I try to have control over because I'd be scared if I can't have control over those things. When my wife and I got married, one of the things that I discovered is um, sometimes we would, uh, when we would butt heads or we would have a little tiff or a little bit of conflict, is I was the, we got to talk about this and we got to talk about this now person. Why are you walking away? There's clearly something wrong. We're going to talk about it. Don't go. Don't go. We need to talk. We need to talk now. Why aren't you talking to me? And that helped a lot. <laughs> it did not help a lot. Um, because in my anxiety to get control, I was making things worse, Right? Um, and, and it's one of the things I think that God has been working on my heart in the last 10 years is, is, is a little bit of like, can you just trust me? Can we release a little bit? I know things may not look okay right now, but they're going to be okay. So why, why don't you trust me and we'll relax a little? I've had idols in my life at different stages that God has tried to work on. Things that can occupy my affection or my attention or I don't want to trust God for, I want to control them myself. The prophets, though, in the Bible, although that's very valid, I can't find a single instance in what they talk about individual idols. They always talk about idols that are in a community, which are so much harder to address because when everybody has probably, without even noticing that it happened, kind of bought into whatever this idol is, everyone kind of just accepts it and defends it together and it is hard on the person that gets close to the heart of God and has to step in and announce that that is not okay. Maybe even a very good thing, like the desire for new people and new herds and new harvest, that is good stuff. But when our anxiety makes that share the spotlight with God Almighty, that's not okay. So maybe one of the quick ways to figure out what are the idols in your community whoever your community is, the people who are like you, the people who are yours. Maybe it's this church, people who um, dress like you, think like you, educated like you, vote like you, whatever, approach life like you, is when there is something that gets threatened and that group of people kind of freaks out and they will like fight to the teeth for that thing, there's a good chance that that's become an idol that that's something that, they, that we have put our trust in. And every community is easy, easily has them. Um, every church, every political group, every family, every region, whatever. You know, I, I've heard one pastor that I look up to says his and his church is the danger that they would become a successful church for successful people. And that that is the idol that they keep having to push back on. That they would not, that they would, that would not be what drives them. But it's tough to recognize what those are. Um, as, as a young person who grew up inside of evangelicalism and all of the good gifts that came from um, evangelicalism, a high view of scripture, high view of Jesus, you know, we would, we like to a weird level. Um, we, we made an idol out of a particular political party and certain politi- political candidates you know, that we put, our, we put too much trust in and instead of the Lord, and that was kind of weird. And when someone would come along and challenge that, um, you know, th- that didn't go well for that person. We would get grumpy with them and, uh, you know, accuse them of, of not understanding things like we did. We were so spiritual. And uh, the prophets usually um, get killed in the Bible. Sometimes they get kicked out. Sometimes they just get beat up or thrown down a well. But like Isaiah gets sawn in half with a wooden saw. You know, like, wow, (laughs) Um, creative. Um, And it's hard on the people who carry the broken heart of God. Uh, He asks them to live out a kind of brokenness in a unique way, like Hosea, um, one of the prophets of the north that we heard from earlier. It says, when the Lord God began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go, marry a promiscuous woman or a prostitute and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. 
you can hear God's broken heart through Hosea as he's talking to the Israelites when he says, I will ruin her vines and her fig trees, which she said were her pay from her lovers. Remember, Baal was God of um, influenced harvest. I will make them a thicket and wild animals will devour them. I will punish her for the day she burned incense to the Baals. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me, she forgot, declares the Lord. Can you hear this like, this broken heart that God is asking Hosea to live out in his life in front of the people. Abraham Heschel, my, my favorite author, he says the prophets say nothing without tears. The people who are close to the heart of God, they are either overwhelmed with the love of God and, they, and when they express it, the joy just has to come out in tears or they are so close to the broken heart of God that when they announce it to the people, they end up weeping. And Hosea and all of the prophets end up bringing embarrassment to a people that have forgot how to be embarrassed at their sin. And, and they use either a life of, of like grand gestures and love or language of like soaring poetry and, and like announcing the greatness of God and, and like this huge tall language in order to try to break through the hard hearts of the people because they care about them. That's what's tough it, is this keeps going somewhere it, is we, we tend to not and should not trust someone that is happy to give us bad news. Someone that is just like a little bit happy to tell you how bad you are, that is someone you should not pay attention to, right? But someone who comes to us with tears and with a broken heart, they're probably going somewhere. Like Hosea says in chapter 10, the people who live in Samaria fear for their calf idol, Beth Aven. Its people will mourn over it and so will its idolatrous priests, those who have rejoiced over its splendor because it is taken from them into exile. It will be carried to Assyria, remember that name, as tribute for the great king. Ephraim will be disgraced and Israel will be ashamed of its foreign alliances. Samaria's king will be destroyed, swept away like a twig on the surface of the waters. The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. And then they will say to the mountains, cover us and to the hills, fall on us. See, in this context, what they know, and, and by the way, this, I don't think this has much to do with the crystal ball. This is just like paying attention to what's going on in the world at the time. Assyria is the rising empire to the east. And they are legitimately terrifying. We'll talk about that a little more in a couple of weeks. That entire empire, they all needed counseling. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on. And they are headed Israel's way. And the prophet knows that these people have chosen to leave God's protection, and he is announcing that they are about to experience the consequences of their actions. And he doesn't want that for them. He doesn't want them to go into exile. He's like yelling at them as they're walking out into traffic, don't do this. Um, Zephaniah, who's in the south, um, says this, chapter two, gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before this decree takes effect and that day passes like windblown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you who, hum who are humble in the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Is that God's wrath is real because his love is real. Wrath, anger is an outflow of a, of a broken heart. And he's trying to get their attention because he cares about them. Sometimes we're scared to bring bad news to a community. We're scared to challenge it because no one's gonna like it. But what's worse is when we experience the consequences of our sin. And God wants to get their attention because he cares Hosea 3, if we could go back to Hosea. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again. This is what God is after. Though she is loved by another man, 
and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Isn't that a weird line? <laughs> that was used in, in worship to the idols. So, listen, listen, listen. I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about an omer and a leketh of barley. And I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will behave the same way towards you. That Hosea's wife has gone um, to live with and, and, uh, and be owned by a pimp. And he buys her back to bring her home with him. And this is God saying to his people, I will pay for your sin. I'll pay, for, I'll pay to get you home. If you'll just come back with me, everything that is wrong, I'll carry it, I'll figure it out. If you're just faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. The prophets do not just carry bad news for bad news sake. They carry bad news for the sake of good news being able to tell people, I want to take you home, to be with me forever. That that is the heart of God that he is offering to his people. It always moves to restoration. Or like if we could go back um, to Zephaniah. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord, your God, is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. It is his love. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. That that is where the prophet is always going. When they take time to hear God's broken heart, it's so that they can tell people that God adores you and he's with you, but he wants your attention. He doesn't want anything to share the spotlight with him. Now here's the tough word. Hosea was in the north, Zephaniah in the south. Um, the people in the north don't listen. And when Assyria shows up in 722 BC, 10 tribes in Israel are never heard from again, and they are wiped off the map and completely erased from history. They're gone. But in the south, when exile eventually comes and they repent, the Jewish people have never struggled with idolatry in two and a half thousand years. Not since then. That they, they heard God's broken heart and said, nothing will ever share the stage with you again. You alone are God Almighty and we will give you all of our trust and affection. They listened. That day came for them. So the question is, what about us? Are we open to hearing from God about the idols in our lives and in the, in the communities that we find ourselves in? And are we open to hearing from someone who we know loves us, but is saying things we don't want to hear, that pushes on those things? And why is it that we get so defensive? Someone that, that brings to us, I think this is wrongly sharing the stage with God Almighty in this community's life and, and that we have put our trust in that thing instead of just following Jesus and, and we get grumpy with that person. Why, what's going on there? Are we willing to make space for the challenge that the prophets want to bring to us for the sake of our strengthening? and eventually encouragement and comfort, that they would bring bad news to us and we would receive it for the sake of the good news that follows. Here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to just end by reading the last chapter of Hosea. And um, if you would, um, if it helps you maybe to close your eyes, you can do that. Or um, if it helps you to read the screens, you can do that. But let's just give the Lord our attention. And as you hear this, just let God speak to your heart.
about you and about your community. Let's be quiet for a little bit. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. For your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer you our praises. Assyria cannot save us, nor can our war horses. Never again will we say to the idols we have made, you are our gods. No. In you alone do the orphans find mercy. The Lord says, then I will heal you of your faithlessness. My love will know no bounds. My anger will be gone forever. I will be to Israel like a refreshing dew from heaven. Israel will blossom like a lily. It will send roots deep in the soil like the cedars in Lebanon. Its branches will spread out like beautiful olive trees as fragrant as the cedars of Lebanon. My people will again live in my shade. They will flourish like grain and blossom like grapevines. They will be as fragrant as the wines of Lebanon. O oh, Israel, Stay away from idols. I am the one who answers your prayers and cares for you. I am like a tree that is always green. All your fruit comes from me. Let those who are wise understand these things. Let those with discernment listen carefully. The paths of the Lord are true and right. And righteous people live by walking in them. But in those paths, sinners stumble and fall. The good news is that God wants to speak. The bad news is that we have given our trust and our affection to so many things. But here's the thing, your success or your education or whatever it is that you put your trust in, whatever way of organizing uh, politics or organizing community, whatever freedom or whatever we have put our trust in, God will not share our affections. But here's the thing, none of those things have pursued us like the Lord. Jesus comes and lays his life down for us to show us what God is like and we can trust him because he is better than anything else. Anything else. Anything else. So let's pray. God, forgive us of our idolatry and help us to carry your broken heart to our community. We want to follow you, we want to hear from you, and we're so grateful that you yourself will pay to bring us home. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to like and subscribe. Feel free to share this with others that God has put on your heart, and to learn more about LaCroix Church, or to find your next steps, head to lacroixchurch.org. Thanks again for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.